What's Underneath is a CastBox original produced in partnership with Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, where you can find all of your favorite podcasts. You can listen to What's Underneath wherever you get your podcasts, but we hope you'll give CastBox a shot and see for yourself. Hello and welcome to What's Underneath, the podcast that will inspire radical self-acceptance through empowering you to embrace what's unrepeatable in you. I'm Lily Mandelbaum, and sitting next to me is my mom, Elisa Goodkind. And we are Style Like You. In our new podcast, we are going to expand the types of intimate, unfiltered conversations we've been having in our viral video series, The What's Underneath Project. Each week, we will interview diverse nonconformists about their relationship to style, self-image, and identity. Being radically honest without shame and holding that honesty with compassion is self-acceptance. Okay, so mom. Hi, Lils. Hey, how are you doing? (laughs) I'm good. How are you? I'm pretty good. Um, Who are we here with today? We are very, very, very excited to be here with Jacob Tobaya, who's an author and producer that we already shot a video with in our Dispelling Beauty Myth series with Allure magazine. After doing that, they have left a very, very strong impression on me on the subject of gender and being gender fabulous. There is one particular thing that really stuck with me in terms of their explanation of gender being like a multifaceted diamond that has endless and infinite refractions and um, permutations and all different types of light and gradations of radiance and of existence basically in a stone and in a gem, which is exactly what gender is about. I had never really thought of it like that, but I haven't stopped thinking about it as that since then. So in other words, we are infinite and multifaceted and can't be put into any kind of a box just as gender can't be. So we're super psyched to get further into, you know, speaking all about this very, very, very important subject and very relevant. So welcome, Jacob. Hi. (laughs) Hi. How are you today? I'm good. I'm really distracted, but only because your really cute puppy is just like hanging out. And I, and like, you keep thinking these little thuds with his paws, like, hang out with me, pay attention to me. And I just, I get really distracted by puppies, but in a good way. Oh, that's sweet. Well, you're actually catching, um, this us in, uh, kind of an, uh, <laughs> underwhelming animal mode right now, because generally we have. We have three animals in this house all every day, an 18 year old cat, a 17 year old blind and deaf poodle <laughs> and the one that the, and the big um, Eeyore who's sitting next to you right now. Eeyore. Um, but we also often have Lewis's dog who doesn't stop barking, who's two years old and is like doesn't stop moving and barking. And we have issues with the podcast. Oh, yeah, you get lot, lots of you know, puppy So barks. usually there's four animals in here all and they may rest of them may enter soon. So. Hopefully you're not going to get even Hopefully more distracted. Hopefully I'll get all of I'll get all three <laughs> well, at hopefully least. Hopefully you will. Yeah. yeah. Jacob, can you talk a little bit about what you're in general feeling like excited about in your life right now? Like what gets you out of bed in the morning? Right now I'm really excited about um feeling a sense of stability for the first time in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um because, you know, I've been I've been transitioning um but not medically, just in terms of career. Uh mm-hmm. for like, you know, the past um for the past 2 years like I was thinking about whether or not I wanted to kind of like jump full time into TV world and, and, you know, like entertainment industry stuff. And I was thinking about it and I was thinking about it and then, you know, finally took the leap and moved to Los Angeles and then, you know, was like in one sublet and then was in another sublet. And finally, like I'm living in a proper apartment of my own, like with people that I like. And I don't know, I guess some of the little things that I'd really taken for granted when you're when you're without that kind of stability for a few for a few years or for a little spell like you start to you start to realize like oh whoa that's actually really important to sort of my my like emotional um survival you know Mm -hmm. and and it's interesting too because in this time of sort of moving um across the country and being less stable than i'd been before um you know i was also doing so much like doing creative work that was so much more intense than anything I'd done before. Um, because I just, so I just basically more or less am finished with, um, the manuscript for my first book. Like it's been accepted as final and now we're just doing a kind of like having a few early readers kind of look at it and make sure that there's nothing that, you know, stands out as like, you know, not cool or whatever. I didn't anticipate how much writing a book would be like healing as fuck. 
You yeah. know what I mean? Like, and, and is I, it, so is it a, like a memoir about your, your life or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, the book is called Sissy, a coming of gender story. Um, is it like Sissy, like S I S S Y or yeah, like C I Yeah. S I S S Y. Um, and so it's, you know, it's very much like, it's very much about how I kind of, you know, not, as much as I can in a book, like the whole journey of how I came into understanding my gender in the world mm-hmm. and came into understanding what claiming my identity meant, you know? Um, and so it's, it's got lots of like clunkiness and lots of like silly little vignettes and all that other kind of stuff. Um, and you know, it, it sort of starts in my life in North Carolina and then goes through, um, my life at like at, at you know, Duke University as an undergrad and trying to figure everything out there. And then it kind of like ends right at college graduation where I'm like, cool, I figured out my gender and everything. Mm. And then it's like, oh shit, now I have to figure it out like for real, like in the world right. as like a non-student person. Right. Um, and then it's sort of like to be continued, you know, it's like at the end of like a 90s TV show. Um, yeah. Meaning that you might do another one? Oh, totally. Like I want to write like, like I want to write like, like, you know, two dozen books in my life. Has that been a dream like for a long time or? Yeah. Like writing a book when I moved to New York four years ago, originally, like when I, when I moved to the city after trying out a stint in DC and thinking I was going to do like public policy stuff, I moved to the city thinking I, I want to write a book. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know exactly how I'm going to frame it, but I want, that's the way I want to tell this story. Um, and that's the way, like, that's the ultimate goal. Um, is to have something that can like sit on a shelf and that is sort of a long form piece of work. And, you know, it, it kind of came about after that, like with, with sort of that as like a pipe dream, you know, it came about much more organically than I'd anticipated because the thing about on, you know, we have, we have this incredible online culture now, right. And we have, um, you know, I, I very much came of age as a writer, um, in a time when, like internet personal essays were like the hottest thing. Like thought catalog. Right, right. right. Like all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Like where you like, you know, you you That's gush your called, right? you gush your deepest Everything's darkest. Out there. Right. Yeah. Right. Like you put it all out there and it's like this whole thing. And you know, in in a thousand words or less. Right. Mm-hmm. Like and and I wrote a few articles that kind of really blew up and that that got a ton of traction and that that became like, you know, big sort of well known things. Like people would stop me in the street and be like, I read that one article. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh like whoa. what? What like what? What was it about? The first one that blew up um, that I ever wrote was, uh, it was for Huffington Post and it was why I'm gender queer professional and unafraid or something like that. And it was basically about navigating professionalism as a gender nonconforming person and Mm -hmm. how like, you know, going to an office job, you can't be perceived as professional when you're gender nonconforming because breaking gender norms uh, puts you outside of professionalism. Mm -hmm. And it was framed within the context of like going to my first day at work, you know, um, after graduating college. So so what what kind of job did you have then? Well, I actually was interning at the human rights campaign. So it's like, you know, it was, it was at an LGBTQ organization. Right. So it wasn't like, it wasn't as much about being afraid in that of, of the people I went to work with there, but about being afraid of everyone else in DC and how they Mm -hmm. would look at me, you know, like whenever I went to anything outside of, the building, you know, like how people like, right. A meeting, uh, you know, like an event, whatever, um, sort of realize, like trying to think about how, like, how do I present myself in a way that where I feel like a bona fide professional or whatever. And, and in exploring that for myself had kind of discovered all these ways in which professionalism fucks over everyone. What do you mean? Can you explain that? Can you explain? Yeah. Like professionalism is like this term that masquerades as neutral. It pretends like, oh, it's just professionalism. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just how you need to be. The idea of what professionalism can and should be is super regionally specific and and in most cases is, like, centered around the needs and desires and expressions of, like, cisgender, heterosexual white men. What phase were you at during that time in your style? Um, And, like, like what were you wearing on a regular basis, like, in your most free day? And then what would you, like, how did you literally, like, grapple with that when you were, would go to work? Well, on my most free day, like wearing whatever I wanted to, I was still, I was sort of like, I had just crested into wearing dresses at that point in my life mm-hmm. and like skirts and stuff. Um, and didn't have a bunch of ones that I loved, but had some, and a lot of it was like, how do I take the clothes that I have already? Cause you know, it's not, it's not like I had, I didn't have like, you know, 
like two thousand dollars to go on a shopping spree at Saks and get everything I needed. You know what I mean? Like in your it, mind, what would you what would you think that you had needed for that situation? Would it be like a pencil skirt or something? Right. I would have gotten I would have gotten like some pencil skirts. I would have gotten some structured dresses that fit me just so, you know, but were really nice and made out of great materials. You know, I would have gotten like there's there's a lot of stuff that I would have gotten if I were trying to buy everything new, but I was trying to thrift stuff at that point, like mm-hmm. partially out of a you know not having a ton of money, having just graduated college, and partially out of like you know a a distaste for new retail, which I still kind of hold. Like mm-hmm. I have trouble with new clothes because mm. they're just it's kind of like like why did like someone did like you know there's just like piles and piles and mountains and mountains of clothing that like no one's wearing and no one cares for. Well, I basically I mean that's a that's a subject I could talk about for a year, which is right. basically. There is, in my opinion, there's basically nothing new to buy, basically. That's like worthwhile, hardly at all. I mean, that's maybe a little extreme, but basically I would say most of it is, and that's, it is another subject, but I couldn't agree with you more. I think there's very little of value that's worth the money that's new, um, that's, that's worth buying. Yeah. And then also, I mean, like environmentally in, in terms of sustainability, you know, like, like I feel better in clothes that are, that someone else wore before because I feel like oh, like this didn't have to, like no one had to run a factory for me to wear this shirt. Like no labor had to be exploited. No people had to be like, you know, um, to have their, have their, you know, dignity harmed in the process of making this. Cause you know, so few clothes I feel like are sourced ethically anyway. And it's not that everything I wear is of that category, but when I'm wearing stuff that's used or vintage, it feels like it's better for me. It's better for the planet and it's better for like people, Mm -hmm, you know? And it also feels like, it feels like, you know, you're, you're, it feels like you're giving something a second chance. Yeah, and and so, you know, I was I was like trying to thrift a lot of stuff and sort of put together my first series of looks for what what could be workplace wear. And, you know, what it landed at was I had I had this pair of pants that were from the suit that my dad had bought me when I was like 16 that I because I was a page at the North Carolina General Assembly. And so I needed like a little, you know, it was like a very conventional um men's suit that wasn't even like it wasn't even like stylishly fit per se like it was kind of just like a little too big and a little oversized but like when worn in a masculine sense like what not in a cute way like Mm -hmm. just in like okay like this is just not quite like my legs are a little skinnier than we all want to admit Mm -hmm. and like you know and this and this jacket is swallowing me a little bit um but I took those pants and like sort of made this whole look for myself that I based that I rocked for like pretty much most of the summer where I just like I took the pants I pulled them up to high waisted height because they had such a like low crotch anyway that mm-hmm. like they were totally fine at a high waisted as a high waisted pant and then I cuffed them up to like sort of n- lower mid calf mm. and so I had like Cute. these little yeah so they turned capris. into these like yeah these like little like professional work work capris um and then I'd wear those <laughs> with a few like you know a few different like kind of shell tops that I would picked up at Goodwill or just like a white dress shirt um you know with uh and then would add like a little like a little silk scarf or something to it mm-hmm. um and and that was a lot of um, that was a lot of the look that I rocked. The other one would be I also had like one or two kind of like high like like higher waisted like pencil skirt type things, but they weren't like super t- you know they weren't like crazy pencils. Mm-hmm. They weren't like they weren't like you can't walk. You know? yeah. yeah, like I could walk in them and they mm-hmm. like couldn't breathe in them and stuff and like eat lunch in them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had yeah I had like one that was maroon and and one that was blue, and like the blue one was a little short to like really wear comfortably at work events. In terms of just like having to like you know, like keep your legs together or whatever, mm-hmm. which is like something that I'm learning to transgress as a norm um, in my life, and learning to just be like you know my legs are here and they are allowed and they are beautiful and they are wonderful and I don't need to keep them close at all times. Um, I because also like I'm I'm wearing underwear right like I'm not flashing anybody right, right. I'm just like I'm wearing like black like like you know boxer briefs right? right like I could just wear that underwear as a bottom and it would be fine right. like if I just walked around in public in those I would not be like you know yeah. like I'm not violating any boundaries here right. um anyway but you know so it was sort of it was kind of figuring out all those things and the thing that was always so interesting for me in that period of my life is like I I had to kind of learn 
femininity in some ways from scratch mm-hmm. um, or sort of like a very like DIY, but without any DIY, DIY tutorials, mm-hmm. you know, like I had just kind of learned by trial and error because there weren't, there wasn't a good guide on like, okay, so you have a body that's a complete box with no curves at all. What do you do? You know, like, how do you, how do you dress that? How do you find things in your size, right? Like what stores do you go to to even get shoes that you want to wear? Right. What shoes are going to be okay and comfortable for you given that you kind of, I call them my mom and I, my mom, this is like one of the times I made her laugh hardest in her life. I was like, yeah, me and my caveman feet. Mm-hmm. And she was like, she like burst out laughing. And I was like, but no, like I have like very wide, like I have very wide feet. Like I can't just fit into like any of the like, you know, super narrow, whatever. So just kind of learning basic rules about like how to find flats that look really sleek and that you like, that you can wear all day, that don't give you blisters. Like, which is, which I think might just be impossible. Like in a I- lot of cases. I, I'm like sitting here. I have so much to say that I feel like I'm going to absolutely like burst right now because <laughs> almost every single thing you're saying, I have the exact same feeling about and the exact same experience with in terms of like what is like, first of all, professionalism, like so, so what in the eye, femininity, professional feminine in the eye of, of, of who, like who, who made right. this? Like, so you're supposed to be like a man, like, a, a, like, like either man ish in this, in a, in a woman's kind of suit or whatever, like, or a pencil skirt. Um, and it like, I love suits. I love wearing suits. I love pencil skirts. I love all clothes, but I don't, Same. but I, but I, <laughs> but I have, but I absolutely cannot understand or accept in any way that there isn't any should in terms of what you should be in terms of what you wear those things the pencil skirt the the professional woman thing the anchor woman that prototype is the male gaze bullshit totally and that was one of the things that was so interesting for me in those sort of early days of of experimenting with my femininity publicly as I started to realize the ways in which feminine like traditionally feminine clothing and and aesthetic and accessories and um and beauty routines are made to police the body like are built around policing the body you know like 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 the first time that i chipped my nail you know and like my nail polish got all fucked up and i want and i was sad that it didn't look good anymore and i realized like oh that's the whole point of this is that you can't do strong things with your hands and you get scared about using your hands powerfully because you don't want to chip this varnish that is input that is put on you. Like the reason it's perceived as beautiful is because it dictates a kind of in its classical form, right? In its non liberated like form, it dictates a kind of like of, of way that you are obligated to use your hands or relate to your body. And you know, the thing for me that's interesting is that I've never felt trapped like I don't feel trapped by femme tradition and I think the same way that a lot of cis women feel trapped by femme tradition because for me mm. it it I'm opting out like I'm opting mm. into something I'm not supposed to opt into mm-hmm. right so like it feel there's always mm-hmm. a sense of power even when my nails get fucked up and also I'm learned to claim like oh wait like I might be, I think I just need to have more punk sensibility about this in general and be like yeah chipped nail is cute you know like chipped totally. nails like, chipped looks great um you know and and I and and also like had a little bit more of like a butch sensibility about it and like, okay, so I'm going to think about what nail polishes are more long wear and sustainable for me to wear that don't get fucked up as easily, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to figure out sort of like a low cost, easy way for me to paint my own nails and have my nails look the way I want them to like on the days and times when I want them to look that way without having to spend a bunch of money and without having to like worry about like, Oh shit, I have to grab an object off of the ground, Mm -hmm. you know? But, and then, and the other thing is, was it was the same way with kind of relating Mm -hmm. to my legs and for differently for the first time, because when I was in a pencil skirt for the first time, I realized, Oh, this garment is designed to make you close your legs. Mm -hmm. It's built Mm -hmm. to force your legs to be in a certain position and to endure that for the entirety of the day because otherwise you're showing people your underwear and culturally we're not supposed to do that. Right. right. And yeah. And so it's yeah. like, it was this revelation for me about the way femme tradition was built around policing the physical and, and, you know, emotional power of cis women and people who are assigned female at birth culturally. Right. And, and then learning to kind of after that, get in touch with like a radical femme tradition that says I can claim this 
in a way that that transgresses those boundaries and wear this in a way that's that that turns it into a fuck you mm. um was really powerful for me too so what happened that's when amazing. so what was like it like at that internship and like how did you get treated as you were exploring like your your style hmm. expression professionally quote unquote <laughs> Like in the workplace, yeah. I mean, because I was working at a, an LGBT organization. In the workplace, it was fine. Mm-hmm. Um, like the office, everyone was fine. I was like, duh, you know. Um, the biggest issue that summer for everybody had nothing to do with gender expression. It just had to do with the mechanics of sweating in D.C. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's summer, and it was like you know July in Washington D.C. When you're walking to work and don't have a car, is a tough time for everybody, Mm -hmm. um, no matter what your gender expression is. But what I did learn is that actually I had an advantage over a lot of my um, more masculine of center colleagues because femininity does, like femme professional tradition does allow you to wear things that, like I could Mm -hmm. wear a a, a, like knee length skirt Mm. and like have a lot of air on my body and on my legs and like have more venting space and wear shoes that didn't like trap all the heat around my, around my feet and also wear a top that was much breezier and and flowier. Whereas like when I, when I was, when, when I was like, you know, 16 and paging at the North Carolina general assembly, like I remember you, you have to wear an under, like, and this is like a certain thing you have to wear an undershirt underneath your shirt because you need something to sop all the sweat up. Right. Because you are so like, cause you have to wear the tie and the dress shirt that does not get shorter in the summer. And, you know, and like an That's undershirt ridiculous. beneath it and cover your legs from, from hip to ankle. Well, cis men have trapped themselves into their own, into summer. Right. Into, in, into a corner. It's so insane when, when it you comes think to the heat. It. Yeah. Right. And but, like, yeah. and so it's so funny um, that I kind of realized like, oh, I actually have like a real leg up, like yeah. literally and metaphorically yeah. <laughs> here because like I, I get to like wear breezier things that make me sweat a lot less. Yeah. Totally. I mean, and I also, I, I feel like that was balanced by the fact that I'm an Arab American. So I sweat a lot just in general. Um, so it was like, you know, it was a nice, it was a nice way to sort of balance things out. Hmm. So you were, so this all came, we were talking about this because you were talking about your book and how you used to like, you know, write articles that were a thousand words or less. And we were talking about whether your dream was always to write a book. And that's kind of, we left yeah. off somewhere in the middle of that story when we started talking about yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, to come full circle on that, you know, I wrote that piece about professionalism and it, and it did blow up and it became like, you know, I mean, it got like 30 something thousand shares in a way that, you know, at a time in the internet where that was like, that was like a thing, you know, this was like 2000, this was like 2014, you know, this wasn't like, like, I feel like it, it's funny because it, in four years, just what internet numbers mean have changed really mm-hmm. dramatically. Like 30,000 shares on Facebook is still a lot now, but like it, it, it doesn't feel nearly as like, Oh, as that like, sounds like a lot to me still. Right. But it doesn't, <laughs> but it, but back then it's like, I feel like there's been like, um, like there's like inflation or right. whatever. Right. So it's like, you know, I feel like it's like I had third, you know, it's like, it's like being having $3 million in 1972 right. rather than having $3 million today. It's still a lot of dollars no matter what. Right. But back then it was like, holy crap, right. you know, like, and <laughs> you know, and so, and so I wrote that it was cool and it was kind Hot of like, topic. I mean, right. you hit on something that a lot of people yeah. really care about and totally. are questioning. Because people were writing me and like commenting like, yeah, like I'm not trans, like I'm like, I'm a black woman and this totally resonates with me because of how I have to change my behavior around professionalism and it's fucked and I hate it. Or someone would be like, you know, I'm like, I'm a cis guy and I, or they probably didn't say cis guy. They probably said I'm a normal guy back in 2014 because that language was still on the up and up. But like, you know, they said like, I'm a, I'm just a normal guy, but I hate professionalism because it makes me wear things that are uncomfortable or blah, 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 blah. You know, like everyone had mm-hmm. like, had some relations like, yeah, professionalism fucking sucks. Um, and it was cool and it was electric and it was awesome. Um, and then from there I started writing things that where I was trying to do more of talking about, cause the question that kind of begged for a lot of people was like, okay, so who are you though? And, and I tried to write a, a bunch of pieces about who I am and about my journey with gender in this world. And got to this point where like I had a formula for how to write like a bomb personal essay that would blow up, which is like open with a vivid scene and an interesting scene, a compelling scene of a time in my life when I was made to doubt my gender or made to feel scared about expressing my gender, how I wanted to get into the political analysis of all of that, like 
and then end with a bombastic conclusion about how you should, you know, you should be yourself, whatever, whatever, like, you know, and how I, how I learned to be myself, you should mm-hmm. be yourself too, mm-hmm. right? And sort of end with that and people w- went bananas, you know, and it was like, that was the story that everyone loved and I could do it like, and I did it, you know, like 13 different times in a bunch of different ways. Right. And, and the articles did well and I got, you know, I got support and I got, and, 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 you know, I built a following and all that stuff. But I had this moment where I had to realize and like look at myself in the mirror and be like, is that enough for you? And also, like, are you tired of only having 1,500 words? Yeah, and like or the wrapping. Words? Um, is, were you tired at all of also like feeling like you had to wrap your story up in some kind of like bow. positive bow or mm-hmm. confident bow when life is like always right. winding and like yeah. up and down? Yeah, like so. the irony was that when I was writing those pieces, like it was the worst my mental health had ever been in my entire life. Right. You know? Can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, like, it was like moving to New York was awful. Becoming an adult was terrible. Can you elaborate? Yes, becoming an adult. I mean, these are just true facts for everyone, right? But like becoming an adult, like in a world in which gender. Yeah, like this is early 20s. This is like 22, you know? Like becoming an adult in a world where gender nonconforming people are not supposed to exist as adults. Um, where you're supposed to grow out of it, where it's a phase that you're supposed to like, you're supposed to grow up and get within the gen, like do your gender right and like stop being a fucking faggot and like, you know, and like, and like, you know, man up, right? Where coming of age and coming of gender are supposed to come together, where you're supposed to become good at your gender by being an adult and like go back into the world and become digestible to the world and like function properly fit under into capitalism. into the little binary and like fit into the, right. fit into the And like as if it's something you are like when you're a kid, you're just like being silly and exploring. Right. You're and in then, college, you're in high school. Oh, and like everyone Thinks that with girls in college, Shannon, but you need to find yourself a real man now that you graduated, you know, like that kind of vibe. Right, right, right. You know, like, like, and, and I think the idea of like this, this, this experimental space that I had, like went from being very affirming and kind of like gentle towards it and kind of like, oh, like at the very worst kind of patronizing, like that was the worst it got was like, oh, it's so cute. You're experimenting with yourself in college. How adorable. You know, like Mm -hmm. that was the worst it got. Um, And it often was better than that. You know, and then to then being in the real world and 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 it being like like actually what the fuck are you doing? Mm-hmm. Like actually what are, what are you doing? Can you like, give some specific examples of like what your struggles were? Like exactly like let's hear. Like watching my my dad have to have the moment where he realized like oh this isn't this isn't this isn't going away is it? Mm-hmm. Oh oh this is you're gonna do this for the rest of your life oh 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 mm. oh. You know, like kind of having, seeing a lot of people in my life. I think everyone waits like, okay, well, we'll see what happens after Jacob graduates college. We'll see where they go, you know? And then just a lot of people kind of having that moment of, oh, this is, this is actually who you are. And I was like, yeah, that's what I've been saying the whole time, idiots. And they're like, no, no, but like for real. And Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you know? Um, And it wasn't that, you know, the, 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 the blessing in, uh, for me was that I was smart enough to put myself in spaces where I wouldn't face so much of it, right? But one of the things that that required was like, I tried to start my career in DC. And after three months there, I was like, you are an alien in this town. Like you are a fucking, you may as well be a Martian, you know, like walking around on Capitol Hill. I mean, the joke I make about DC is that even if I were a cis woman, I would be too much for DC by a long shot, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think all of us in this room, regardless of how we name our identities, would be way too fucking much for Capitol Hill. I would have no friends there. Right. None of us would have any friends. We would be we'd all be outcasts. Like my pantsuits would, they would be like, but your pantsuits are the wrong color, Jacob. You can't wear cobalt to Capitol Hill. And I'd be like, I am not wearing navy and you can't fucking make me. Cobalt is the bluest I can get without feeling bad. My mental health was so abysmal because I felt like an embarrassment to like to the movement everywhere I went. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please subscribe. And give us a good rating so the powers that be can keep this podcast going. I'm just picturing my head right now because I go crazy enough with the amount of black in Manhattan, you know, the kind of beige of blackification of the fashion industry in general, even in... Not the good blackification, the bad blackification. I mean, like the... Like the physical color black being the only color you can wear in your garments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like that everyone is in the same... No, no, not like the same color. Right, I was like, let's clarify, because the the blackification could be very good. No, 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 no. no. I'm not talking about human... Yes. Not about, talking, not about, we're not talking about race and ethnicity. We're talking about a uh, palette in the fashion world. I'm talking about the same yeah. jacket. Okay, just clarifying yeah. for everybody. Because I love yeah. the blackification of Hollywood on a, like, oh, ethni- I love uh, on a racial and ethnic level and identity level. Yes. Give me the blackification right. and racial But I do not identity. like the blackification <laughs> of fashion as uh, when it comes to actual color of garment. Yeah, yeah.
Right. That's what she's referring to. That's what yes. I'm referring to. I guess. Also, it was just too good of a like. Yeah. It was too good of like a, a like a double so, meaning to not yeah. point out because it's also yeah. kind of hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just now I'm imagining through your <laughs> eyes DC and what I mean. I think if I was like walking into restaurants or walking around on the street, the level of homogeneity mm. and the dullness of fashion and what it has become the uniform or whatever that is that one feels they have to subject themselves to to be considered professional i think might make me weep right like, and it in did a really like it, big way. it that's what it, i mean like it was i was a, i was a total mess in dc <laughs> you know i had really cool friends and i was living with some really great people so like that helped but like i was a mess i just i couldn't stomach it i couldn't stomach it at all and and it was like it felt like it was it felt like the price of staying in dc was just like killing many parts of myself mm -hmm. and i was like i can't do that like i'm not capable of doing that and and so much of my adult life has been about trying to figure out how can i get how can i manage to survive under capitalism while not killing the parts of myself that i love you said something about how you felt like you were um like like harming or ruining the queer movement or something or like like an embarrassment to the unembar cause right yeah. embarrassment to the cause can you elaborate on what you mean by that well i mean this is actually so so the reason i'm in new york and we can record this podcast is because i'm giving um i'm actually giving the keynote at the nyc pride rally on friday um which i'm really excited about i think it it it, it feels like i don't know it just i'm a history nerd so like the fact that that is like the original pride rally like in the United States, mm -hmm. like it is, it was it, like the first one happened in 1969, two months after Stonewall, you know, and that like following that I get to be part of that tradition is like really cool. Mm -hmm. And also it's one of the few events, um, if, if the only event at Pride that is not, uh, that is not corporate sponsored at this point. So it's like one of the few that kind of really is, stays part of the activist tradition and stays part of the community tradition and the community organizing tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so it feels it feels really cool and, and sort of like a, like a deep honor to be part of that. But one of the things I'm talking about um, is that the, the irony to me of the queer movement, or, well, I shouldn't even say the queer movement, I should say the irony of, of kind of like the LGBT movement, right? Like as it's known when it's, when it's sort of formally put in the letters is that the people who started it were were like the gender nonconforming gender fucking rebels and it was about gender right like mm. because sexuality and gender like sexuality itself like is part of gender normativity right like expecting a man to be interested in women is part of the gender binary like that is right. a tool of the gender binary right like, like heterosexism subset, right? is derivative of like cis sexism, like, you know, like heteronormativity is derivative of cis normativity, mm -hmm, right? Like mm -hmm. it is, and, and like when we shouldn't get that twisted, we shouldn't pretend that they're equal systems that sit side by side. No, one is above the other. Gender normativity. One is like an umbrella. Like right. The gender Gender the norms umbrella. are the umbrella right. Right. That, that, that trans people are pointing out and, and gender nonconforming and trans and queer activists have been fucking with for generations and have been challenging for generations. And underneath gender normativity is the, is normative sexuality. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they're that I, and they're different things in terms of like how you identify. Right. Like they're not right. the same identities. Right. Just be. But right. I do believe that being gay means you're gender nonconforming mm -hmm. under the gender binary. I do believe that like being a gay man, you are a gender nonconforming man, whether or not you want to acknowledge that. Right. Right. Even if you are like the butchest gay dude on the planet. Like fucking other guys means that you are gender nonconforming according to the classical because standards of the gender binary. Because you don't fit into the, bi the the way that the gender binary would talk, talk about what into a man is. Into the classic is. heterosexual. No, because the, not heterosexual. Is baked into heterosexual. the gender binary. Meaning that if you're into, if you're a man who's into other men, that is already of outside of what. A, quote, a man is quote unquote supposed to be within the gender binary. Right. Because the gender binary has heterosexuality baked into it. Right. Like it's in the dough. It's in the batter. It's already been baked. Mm -hmm. It's there. Like you, and I think there's sometimes in our heads as a, as an LGBT movement, we delude ourselves into thinking that we can somehow leave the binary intact, but like, but just refilter and get the heterosexuality part out of it, mm. you know? And I'm like, that's never going to work. It's in, it's in the actual cake. Like the I, cake is already baked. It's already together. You can't remove the egg once it's mixed with the flour. Blasting, smashing, erasing the gender binary and everything that is under it 
is essential to the entire health of our entire society and every binary. It's so literally like, everyone on the planet. It goes back to your expression about the stone and the and the and the and the diamond and the multifaceted aspect mm. of every human being, and how no one is li- exactly like the other actually in any way, including this way. So um, once that once the gender binary gets eradicated. It then, it then, it then leaves, you know, begs the question, what binary is left or worth right. it? There isn't. Right. So it's, you know, it, it leaves everything up to multifaceted and multidimensional and multi mm. and individual. And yeah. And in a world without the gender binary, we wouldn't even have heterosexuality. The idea mm-hmm. of it wouldn't mean anything. Exactly. It'd be like, but what's, you're not, what's the opposite? Just into Where's the into. opposite? Right. What is, what's an opposite? Mm-hmm. How does an opposite work? Mm-hmm. There's no opposites here. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. neither it would homosexuality. It takes away all of the fear of the other. It takes right. away all of the fear of the other. Yeah. Like you, I mean, I guess you could say that maybe like, I mean, cause, and this is like, that's like in a hyper conceptual world, right. right? Like I understand that we can also build towards a world where like we have an under, like there is, there's a way like we can get rid of the gender binary entirely, Right. But probably what's what it's more realistically going to look like in as a transition step is is an idea of gender pluralism, right? That's that's what I that's a term that I use a lot is which is it's about understanding it's about having a plural like that the gender is a that there's a plurality of genders, right? That there are like seven, eight, nine, the exact finite number doesn't matter, but that like there are that there are groupings that that people are allowed to have. There are gender identities that people are allowed to have you get to choose exactly which ones work for you and how you describe yourself. And everyone has more than one, Mm -hmm. you know, and there aren't just two, right. That there are like, that there are like a list of a hundred or 300 or however many we want in terms of where, like in terms of adjectives and, and, and ideas and identities. Right. So like you can be femme and, and you can talk about what your body, what structures your body has or doesn't have, what organs your body does or doesn't have. You know, you can talk about mm. like what you enjoy wearing. You can talk about what you enjoy doing. You can talk about what what activities you enjoy. Do. Like, you know, there are ways to describe gender. Who you, that, And who you love. Right? I mean, who you yeah, and who you to. love can be part of that. Right. Where it can be about like, OK, like, but it wouldn't mean it wouldn't be like, oh, I'm a straight woman. Like that wouldn't tell us enough information under gender pluralism. So would what be, would your like gender plural is pluralism? definition of yourself like be so if I had to define my sexuality like well if I just find my gender under gender pluralism Mm -hmm. I would just like I would say that I am a that I follow in femme tradition that I'm male bodied um that I uh I feel comfortable as a like as like I feel kind of boyish in moments I also feel very girly in other moments but I never feel like a man or a woman because like man or woman feel like like that's like the standard like official rubric, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. The so most like, do you think there's a place on either side? Do you think there's right. a place in the future for like? Because this is something I think about sometimes. Because I've been genuinely like, do I feel like like? Because I do feel like. I mean, I, I, it's hard to break down like why I feel like a woman and why she feels good to me or not. But yeah. like, but like, do you think that in the like ideal future of the world, like? he and she would like, is there a place for he and she in your dream of like the future? And is there a place for like what that kind of like, like would the goal be that sort of what you just said that like, I never feel like a man or woman isn't even a thing because there is no such extreme Mm. like sort of like uh, symbols of like what that kind of norm means like to even compare yourself to or I don't know, that's a few questions, but, but. Yeah, I'm just curious right. about like doesn't he or she exist? Yeah, like is it do, is it, are all of us who think that we're he and she and feel comfortable in that like just kind of like a little less woke or something or a little no, no I'm no, I'm just truly like I I wonder that something about we myself, all talk about like, a lot. Right. or is like is there a place for for that and it's just about accepting that there's more than that I don't know I think it's like <laughs> yeah I think it's 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 not that there's not a place for he and she. It's not that there's not a place for manhood or womanhood mm-hmm. um, because you can't say that there's not a place for anything. Right. Like it, there's a place for all of it because it's here, mm-hmm. right. because it exists, because it's real and people feel it. Um, and it, and also be identifying as he or she doesn't mean that someone is less like woke or less aware <laughs> or less, less radical or less dynamic or whatever. Right. Um, there are so many because there are so many different gradations of both he and she. What is important is acknowledging the history of those terms, 
Do you think that it's possible that like, because sometimes I also think about is the goal that he and she um, just has can also reflect more than it currently reflects or can say more like can have more multitudes within it than it currently reflects or is that just do you think that that's kind of a lost cause within because there's just so much already been put on he and she that like there's not that we have to create a, like we have to create way more ways of obviously I mean obviously we have to create more mm. ways and more words for expressing who we are but I'm just curious like your thoughts on like just sort of the legacy of he and she and whether there's whether you believe there's any hope for like also expanding like what those can mean. R- right. Right. I I think when I think about about gender my goal for everybody mm-hmm. and I think a shared goal that we all have, right? Mm-hmm. That every human being really really wants is that we have as much space and our gender as we could desire, Mm -hmm. right? That we have the space we need to fully express ourselves and live within the, live in the world and, and, you know, and move freely, right? That, that no one should have to experience their gender in a way that feels confined or trapped. Mm -hmm. And some of us are, you know, some of us are gender nomads where we go from one place and we set up camp for a little while and then we go to another place and we're always moving around and moving around is part of the, how we live, mm-hmm. right? And some people are more homebodies and just kind of like they, they feel more comfortable staying at one place, wherever that place may be, mm-hmm. right? And and some people have gotten used to the idea or have, or have, have become accustomed to, whether it's for good or for bad, um, not being able to move at all. Mm-hmm. Right. And what and I think the way that I try and approach my work when it comes to gender is that any strategy for getting yourself more space. Right. Or acknowledging that others need more space, right. even if you don't, mm-hmm. um, is a strategy that I support. Right. Right. And- so broadening what masculinity means, making the man box bigger, giving men more room to move around. Right. And stay within a box or whatever. Like. Sure, conceptually, do I want that box to not exist? Maybe. One day it may be nice. But there's going to be a point we could reach where if we widen both of the boxes so much that they come together and they that they may kind of they may just kind of fall apart on their own. Right. You right. know? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. so so there is mm-hmm. such beauty in broadening masculinity and femininity. There's equal beauty in broadening masculinity and femininity and pushing with all of your might against the edge of that identity from within it. There's that, there's beauty in that and an equal beauty in jumping out and saying, I'm not in any box and I am unboxed and I don't have the support. One is a riskier position, Mm -hmm. right? When you're not within a box, you are much more at risk for being hurt and, Mm -hmm. you know, in the world and, and, and experiencing violence. Mm -hmm. But, but pushing from within the box to broaden it is, is so vital. Mm -hmm. And we've seen, we've seen an incredible, I mean, that is one of the most, to me, one of the most incredible and meaningful contributions of feminist activism over the last century, at least in, you know, in, 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 in the United States and in sort of the cultures that I understand, Mm -hmm. right. Um, is that I think the, the, the idea of womanhood has been there's so much real estate in there now. Right. Like, you know, there's been so much pushing because people have been pushing with all their might against Mm -hmm. the edge of that box for generations and generations and generations. And we, and, and when you look at what, when you look at sort of the, the freedom of expression that, that people who are understood as women in our culture enjoy, granted it's still, it's still, you know, there's, I'm not saying that like sexism doesn't exist, but that within the idea of womanhood, how broad the range of womanhood can be Mm -hmm. in terms of aesthetics, in terms of what it looks like. Um, it's really incredible, but the problem is that we haven't done the same thing for men. Exactly. And that's that's... why there's, we're having all the problems we're having. That's why we're in such a tipping point of violence and, and we have Donald Trump as president. um, Right is because men need a liberation and men need this sense of freedom, which takes me back a little bit to you at 22 um, with your dad and what your dad said to you and you having the strength inside of yourself to to um, trust your feelings. Hmm. Hmm. You know, like you were able to just say, I, this isn't what I, th- I feel this way and I'm going to stay with the way that I feel um, despite all of the questioning, and especially from your father, you know, which is not an easy thing to do um, for anybody, I think. Mm. Um, and so I have to really 
you know, I'd love to just really hear maybe your thoughts on that. Like how, how does one begin? How does, and especially a man who's not made to trust their feelings typically, how, you know, can you just talk about that and how you, how you're feel, you know, how you understand what are your feelings and how you mm. trust those feelings and why you trusted those feelings. And, um, and, and, and even though you knew that you were going to have to withstand so much unhappiness and, mm. Yeah, aloneness and everything else that came with it. What I don't want to pretend ever in the work that I do is that my the work that is that is that the way I navigate gender comes from a place of selflessness. Right? Like the exploration I've been doing in terms of my own gender has been in some ways a really a really selfish enterprise, right? Um where it 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 didn't come from a place of like, "Oh, I need to do this for the world." Um it came from a place of like, how do I survive and navigate the world as me? And not kill yourself, which is what you said. Right. Yeah. Right. And and so and that, you know, I'm I'm not like I don't want to get too much into it, but like that's not a euphemism. Like like saying like not kill yourself is not like it's not, not like a joke. it's not a joke. Like it's an like and for many for most trans people, it's not like we make that joke a lot, but it's like no, no but like the, it, it's it's much deeper and more real than a lot of people want to acknowledge. Even just looking at the statistics within the community, you know, mm-hmm. about about how many people make that, you know, make attempts on their lives or whatever. Um, but for me, it was like, it was about understanding that my gender was one part of it. And then the rest of my personality was the other part. And for better or for worse, like, I can be really insufferable, like for other people and for myself in terms of in terms of like, I just can't not. You Most of the time, I have very yeah. little impulse control. <laughs> I have very little ability to stop myself from doing things. I cannot regulate my emotions very well. Like I'm not capable of not saying things that I'm thinking very often. Like it takes a lot for me to do any of those things. And all of the sort of <laughs> the factors about my personality, like put it in any body of difference. And that person's going to be an activist. Because Mm -hmm. I, because I'm just a little, I'm a little stubborn. I kind of, I'm kind of queenly. Like I sort of, you know, I need a lot of attention. I care a lot about external validation and affirmation. And so I, I, I care. These are just who I am, you know? And so it was like, well, you're that. And you're also like, you know, this sissy queen fag goddess. So guess you got to figure out a way to navigate the world in that Mm -hmm. because I can't stop myself from expressing what I'm feeling in my own, in my own brain and in my own heart. I'm terrible at regulating myself. I'm terrible at falling in line with things when I need to fall in line with them. It makes me not very effective under capitalism many times, well, you know? Makes me not very effective politically a lot of times. But it's just... But but the beauty for me is that I've finally learned to claim a career and a space in which I'm no longer trying to navigate with it against that current. Mm-hmm. You're in your own lane. Right. It's funny because I used to think in my early career when I was in D.C. and I was miserable, I thought... God, the current of the world is just going against me. This is terrible. And then I had this moment where I realized uh, it might be a little true, but that's not the more that's not the important part. The really important part is that you're going against your own current. Uh, uh-huh. Like you can't pretend you're not an artist, kid. You can't pretend you're not a performer. You can't pretend you don't want to be on stage. You can't pretend you don't want to act. You can't pretend you don't want to be on camera. You can't pretend you don't want to produce. You can't pretend that you don't look at people on red carpets and go, I want to do that only because the performative aspect of it is so cool. And I could, I could do really well in that space. Mm-hmm. Like you can't deny your dreams. You can't deny what you want. You can't pretend you don't want it. You can't pretend you shouldn't try and get it. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> essentially what you're saying is you can't lie. Right, which is an to asset yourself. and a liability. If you've ever mm-hmm. read any of those, like you know, the, the you know those like those like little stories you'd read as a kid about like you know Billy had to not lie for a whole day, and by the end of the day, he had no friends. Mm-hmm. You know, but, you know. But what you're saying, <laughs> but what you're saying, what you're saying is so <laughs> incredibly valuable and so important, essentially, which is, it, which I think we'd have such a different world is if if we didn't lie to ourselves mm. and we weren't trained mm. or afraid, you know, like it's, it, it, it's like the, that you are so free to say all of the, that you want to be all of these things that you're not, mm. you know, you're not putting yourself in a, in the trans box either. You're just, you know, you're this mm. person who mm-hmm. wants to be on the red carpet, who wants to do this, who didn't want to be this in Washington. You're, you're all these things. Mm. And the fact that you, you, exactly what you're saying you didn't go against your yourself 
you weren't your own, you, you couldn't be your own worst enemy. Do you feel like that voice has ever gotten the best of you and you have um, like... Yeah. I mean, I but I don't want to pretend that it's like, it wasn't about my family. Right. Um, like my family has been, I feel like, I feel like, you know, I, I like my relationship with my dad is actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and like, and you know, we like really enjoy spending time together and we've worked kind of hard to get to a place where we can, where we enjoy mm-hmm. that again. Um, and also I've, I've come to a place too where I've finally like given myself space and this is part of like going against kind of this movement ideology or going against, um, going against the idea that, that like my gender has to be the same everywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I think I finally got into a place with my family and with people in my intimate life where like different people get different rules based on whether or not they've earned it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, my dad has earned leniency mm-hmm. and earned the right for like him to have like, like he's, you know, like I, I'm okay being like, yeah, like I don't need to like I don't like need to wear a lipstick at the dinner table just to get a rise out of you. Mm-hmm. And like it's fine. Like and I and I'm no less me when I'm not wearing lipstick, right? I don't mm-hmm. have to have the feminine mm-hmm. expression in order to still be me, right? Because that's the other trap mm-hmm. that I fell into the second time, mm-hmm. right? The first trap was you can never wear lipstick or skirts or and be feminine at all. You must be a man. Mm-hmm. And the second trap was well, if you're not gonna be a man, you better be. You better be high femme goddess all the time or the moment you stop, you lose the right to do it altogether. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You better be consistent and stable and have a stable gender in the way that all the rest of us have a stable gender. And you better be the same day to day. And if you do different things on different days, you lose the right, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and that pressure came not just, that pressure came from complicated places, right? Like that pressure comes as much from like magazine editors or like, or like, you know, or, or like movement people sometimes like that pressure comes from a lot of right. different kinds mm-hmm. of sources well, that was of like, like mm-hmm. can you just look the same way? Like, can you be the same kind of gender thing so that we can establish mm-hmm. this and grow this? Because if you're moving around too much, it's going to be hard for people to be comfortable with you. Brand mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and so like, for example, one of the things that like, like my mom still gets my pronouns wrong all the time. Right. And I don't give a shit. <laughs> Meaning she says he. Yes. My mom calls me he all the time. And I could not give two fucks. That's I just amazing. don't care because you want to know why she raised me. She loves the shit out of me. She has earned the right to do like she could say anything to me she wanted in the entire world. And I would be like, still love you, you know, and and I don't care about like pronouns, like as much as the public talking point that I'm supposed to give. Right. And the, st- the stable thing I'm supposed to give is like, I am they, I am them. And if you don't call me, they, them, you're a monster and terrible. Right. Like that's what we're supposed to say. Right. As, as moving people, that's the consistent answer. But the reality is like language is symbolic. And what my mom, what, what I feel when my mom says he, what my mom means when she says he for me is radically different than what some fucking Republican congressman would mean if he said he for me. Or what right. some New York Times editor would mean if he said he for me, right? right? Or what some reporter or 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 a talk show host or whatever would mean if they misgendered mm-hmm, me, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I want to acknowledge that difference. I deserve to acknowledge that difference. I'm allowed to have multivalenced, layered, complicated feelings about things. We, I just want to take a minute and acknowledge um, your parents and the fact that you feel that way and, and the kind of freedom that they've given you to be exactly who you want to be, even if... Some of it isn't, hasn't always been that easy for them. Mm. They've still let you Mm. and they've still given you and you know, they love you. Yeah. Like my parents are the best. I mean, like they have issues, right? Like I have issues with my parents. Of course. We have political disagreements all the time, but like our love is just so real. You're not afraid the love's going to be withdrawn if you are not exactly what they want. Which is right, and and I've kind of had to, you know, there are ways in which I've had to beat them into submission um, on that point, and, and across not just gender stuff, right? Like like telling your parents, like, hi, I just turned twenty six and rolled off of your health care plan, and now I'm gonna not have a full time job for the next five years, mm-hmm. and they're like, oh no, you know, and like they have their own feelings of being like they've had to unlearn <laughs> everything. They've probably honestly, mm-hmm. I think that the fact that I'm an entertainer and that I work in the entertainment industry gives them more anxiety than the fact that I'm gender nonconforming about sort of like my long-term life outcomes right. and what like what they think I need in order to be happy. You know, like that's a bigger like it's it's just so funny. We have such a silly relationship. But I mean, that does kind of answer. I think, Mom, you were asking earlier, like, how did Jacob become this person that can listen to the listen to themselves the feelings. and just trust their feelings? Yeah, and, just sit in like, okay, I'm this, I'm that, I'm right. that, I'm this, I'm this, I'm that. I mean, that's just a gift. And, and also just comes, you just, I think the, the thing that we all owe ourselves, the thing that is most important in this world is to start from a place of just being like, 
okay, so I am a human being. That means that I'm a mess and kind of a trash person, just default on some levels. <laughs> totally. What else do I know about myself? <laughs> exactly. That's it's the most like liberating a, identity I have no, as a trash human. It's just like you're gonna, you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're so flawed, and you're so unapologetic. Or whatever. We're, we're all so fallible. We're all so flawed. We're all such messes, and, and just that's really the whole thing. That I think that's one of the most important thing in terms of our relationships and our interrelationships. And our fears of others and our judgments and our criticisms that we got to get over is that, you know, we're all right. We're, we're all a big mess. You, <laughs> you know, know trying know. to be better, you know. Right. You want you want to know how I know my parents love me? Yes. So I, I was you know, move, in moving into my new apartment. I had to go to Ikea, right? And like get, a, all, get all furniture all from scratch, which is like something that really like you should only have to do like maybe once or twice like on, in your adult life. Right. And this is my second time. And I was like, I literally just bought the same bed that I'd had in New York, but just did not, you know, it didn't make sense to ship it across the country. Mm -hmm. Like it was just like a very kind of sad, weird moment of like, what am I doing with my life? Like, why did I come all the way out here? Like what, what is going on? <laughs> you know? And then so you're was, buying the same inexpensive, like kind of dorm roomish bed. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just like, okay, here we go I can again. totally picture Lewis having that same. Effect. Right. Like yeah. it is three years later. I have accomplished so many things in my career that I all like all my goals, or whatever, and I'm buying the same exact bed at IKEA. That you have three point seven million ago. views on your Allure video, and you're right. buying the same. And I'm buying the same IKEA bed. You know, it's like it's <laughs> like what what is going on? You know, and and like and and I had the day where like it was supposed to be delivered, and I was moving a bunch of my other stuff and packing up my old spot and whatever, and the delivery got messed up. And it was on a Saturday. It was supposed to get delivered on a Saturday between one and five p.m. Right, and the delivery people came. They, I was taking a nap at 12.06. I was going to get up at 12.30 and drive to the new apartment and be there by 1 p.m. and wait the whole afternoon. They called at 12.06 while I was asleep, right, like, and said, hey, we're here, and then, you know, waited 10 minutes and then left. And I was like, you can't do, like, you can't do that. Like, you're not allowed to do that. Like, if you give me a 1 to 5 p.m. window, you have to come between 1 and 5. And if you're not, if you're there early, you have to wait until 1 before your 10-minute period starts. <laughs> like, that is contractually what we are obligated to do for each other. Like, you are in breach of protocol. I am having issues and feel, you can tell how frustrated I am about it, just, like, watching me talk about it. <laughs> and so I lost my mind. I, like, lost my mind. I was, like, so upset because it was, like, all this instability I was already already feeling all of this like holy shit what am I doing with my life art that I was already feeling and then just to have this blatant bureaucratic because so much of you know life is navigating bureaucratic violence especially when you're not digestible mm -hmm. under a system you know mm -hmm. and so like just to have this very blatant bureaucratic violence like put into my life and then I I, I just totally lost my shit and I was <laughs> and I was on the phone for three hours on hold too because if you try to call a key on a Saturday afternoon and get customer service like good fucking luck but I was like I have to catch that truck before it goes back to the warehouse because then it's going to be another three days until I get a bed, you know, like, and, and so I was like losing my mind and the text thread that I sent to my family, I texted the family group thread and I think I like cursed at and insulted every single one of my family members because I was losing my mind. And at the end they were just like, we understand we're, we, you're just really stressed out. We're all fine. We forgive you. Don't worry. Aww. And Forgiveness. I was like, right. And I was like, wow, like I, Cause knowing like being like, like wearing lipstick to the dinner table d and not getting yelled at does not mean you're accepted, but wearing lipstick to the dinner table. Right. And then the next day, like having a freak out in lipstick and being a total piece of shit to your parents for like a moment when you're like totally losing your shit in lipstick and them still not being mad and still being fine with you, like being able to be a mess and be who you are means that you're not on some tightrope where you have where you only get to be who you are by earning it. Mm. And that was what was so fundamental for me is like I I I with my own family I'd been like I know I don't have to not be the messy one because I'm the trans one. Right. I can actually be the mess of the family for mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to be the family problem today. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to not be that because I'm scared that I'm going to lose your love and mm -hmm. affection and affirmation mm -hmm. because it's so thin anyway. It's yeah. like, and, no, it's and thick therefore by now. even despite the fact that you're up against so much, it gives you this feeling like ultimately of like safety. There's right. a, there's an ultimate feeling like everything's going to be okay, which is so essential mm. to parents parenting and um, it's everything. And um, and forgiveness, I think that's, uh, as they're all really already sick of listening, it's my new thing now, like, uh, because I've had this session with this, this healer recently that 
really has changed my life. And it, it's all about forgiveness and, and the importance of forgiveness. Um, and I, we were actually joking yesterday that, um, now this is going to be the new, like, like for, like, cause I, I, I can be sort of ahead of my time in certain ways, like too ahead of my time mm-hmm. or like for my own good and fall flat have on my face that about you until you said it. I'm like, of course you're ahead of your time. I, 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 I have fallen. I have fallen on my face. <laughs> Everyone who's ever met you has known that. Yeah. Every, every time I have fallen on my <laughs> right? face so many times yeah. because I'm too ahead of my time. Right. I, have, I have failed and flopped and like and 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 like never been paid any. She never. launched. She started a yoga studio when I was like three years old yeah, in never, like nineteen ninety three or like four. Never, <laughs> never before been, yoga was you know, a thing. Never been rewarded financially. I mean, I'm I'm always in the wrong. Like it's just like it's too. And then everything right. and then everything comes after, and everyone else gets paid all the money and and and, and everyone caught. You know, like it, it's just how it's always been. So I mean, I just feel forgiveness is like. Uh, the new, like I feel, is 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 like going to be the new. <laughs> it's going to be how we're all going to heal and and get Donald Trump out of the White House because, mm. um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all so different and we're we we're all so unique and and um and it's so important to identify these differences and to respect these differences and embrace and and love and accept the other. Mm. But at the end of the day, we have to forgive each other for not necessarily saying the right, un, for not maybe understanding the right pronouns, um, mm. even though we intend to or want to, or for not, you know, or for all the, you know, for, for the unconscious systemic racism that we perpetuate or for whatever, you know, systemic racism. Yeah. Well, you know, whatever it is, I think that what are, you know, if we are going to have a world, um, where, you know, it's a better world, we're going to, we're going to need to have some forgiveness and, mm. and, and, you know, in order for people of in general, like minds, you know, to have, we want them to be the ones in power mm. and not, you know, and not be fighting with each other so that, you know the, the 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 one with the very unlike even mind. Even have to forgive the one with the unlike and even mind. to forgive ultimately <laughs> them. I mean that's like a big stretch, but yes. I mean even everyone, yeah. everyone. Um. So I think your yeah. parents mirror like a, you know, their behavior. I I have no doubt in my mind that, um, based on you as a as a as a mirror to them and what you've been given, you know, understand what I'm talking about. Even with all of the violence and the bureaucratic violence and all of the hideous things that you've had to deal with your whole life, which Mm. I'm sure are, you know, are just unbearably awful and disgusting, um, that you still are going to, you know, that this is why you're a leader and why you're leading that, you know, Mm. us all in this way and why, and, and ultimately that, you know, forgiveness and love and understanding is at the, you know, at the end of the day going to be what I feel that you're, it's part of your message. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just feel like, I don't even know where I'm going with all this, but like <laughs> no, forgiveness. I love that. Forgiveness. It's the only way to heal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't, you can't, you can't heal. You can't heal until you forgive. Mm-hmm. And that's what was, that was what was so transformative about writing this book, you know, oh, yeah, full which I feel bad because I'm mentioning it and like no one can even read it yet. Um, but like I had to take a hard look at everyone who had hurt me and just forgive them. And then, write about them and then send them the manuscript and say, Hey, are you cool with how I wrote about this? Mm. But in order to do that, I had to be able to figure out That's how great. do I understand where they were coming from? Mm. You know, how do I, how do I, yeah. how do I, I have to put myself in their shoes and understand what their anxieties were and understand why they were acting the way they were. Mm. And the answer is always because we are all broken in some way and we are all trying to heal in some way. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, yeah, like I'm all I want, all I want these days is I just want to keep healing. And I'm trying to heal and heal and heal and heal. And I'm trying to heal through the art and the work that I create. And it'd be really cool if that also paid my bills. Mm. We feel exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Ditto. <laughs> yeah, I was just curious if you could go back to just finishing your thought about why when you were initially like expressing your gender identity, you were feeling like you were, like through clothing and stuff, you were feeling like maybe an embarrassment to the, the queer movement, you were saying, mm-hmm. right? I think that historically there have been a lot of a lot of gay men and and to a much lesser extent um, queer women and lesbian women who have tried to gain rights in this world and respect in this world by reassuring everybody 
that no, 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 I'm still a man or no, 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 I'm still a woman. Right. And politically that's a very powerful tool, right? Mm -hmm. I get that. I get that it's a very powerful tool, but it's building a house on sand. It's not, you know, that's not a firm foundation upon Mm -hmm. which to build any kind of freedom because it will, it will be taken away from you. It will go away. It won't last. There's no staying power in reaffirming. If, if the idea is like, okay, but as long as you're enough of a man, then you're, then you're fine. Then you can be gay. Like then you, you don't have rights. To, that's not a real, mm-hmm. that's not real freedom to begin with. Mm-hmm. Right. And so there are people in the movement who, and, and this is changing because we're changing it, mm-hmm. but like there, <laughs> there are, and were people, and especially were people in the movement who did not know how to let gender nonconforming people lead, um, or be part of this, you know, the movement in a, in a, in a visible way, because we call into question that entire premise. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. slowly, but surely, um, I think that, that especially gay men are really coming around to being like, oh, we shouldn't have to guarantee a kind of manhood in mm-hmm. order to be able to, to love and be held how we want to love and be held. Mm-hmm. We should be okay. able so to express ourselves freely and have a gender that is free and also still be able to love and, and be held. Because the reality and the reason why I titled the book Sissy, right? The reason why Sissy is such a powerful word to me is that both like that, that trans women were called Sissy when they were kids Gay men were called sissy when they were kids. Straight men were called sissy when they were kids. Sissy is about policing masculinity before we even understand mm. any of these other identities in our lives and in our hearts, mm-hmm. you know? And that's what I'm trying to undo. Totally. So there are people who made me feel like, you're really messing up our agenda, kid, you know? Mm. Like, and we need to put you in a box or put you away mm-hmm. or not let you on stage right. because you're you're too, you don't take yourself seriously enough and you don't take your gender seriously enough and your gender is a threat to our strategy. Mm-hmm. You're, you're freeing them. Right, right. You're freeing right. them from their own prison. Right, yeah. totally. Internalized like homophobia. And most of those people have come around. Right, right. No one ever, there, people rarely said that to me explicitly. Right, but it was There were a few times where I got explicit nuggets that were really nice because I was like, cool, I can use that in a book one day. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But like no one ever said explicitly, but you feel it and you know it to be right, true. Right. And and that pressure has really shifted over the past that's, few years mm, of my career. That's very exciting. Yeah. I think that's extremely exciting. What is like a current sense of uh, source of shame in your life? Do you feel like you have any current sources of shame? Um, the current source of shame that I'm trying to figure out now is um, – feeling like I finally got some access to some of the stuff that I'd wanted for a really long time. Um, Like I'm having very serious conversations with producers and working on projects really seriously in a way that I don't know if many, like certainly not many trans or gender non-conforming people have gotten the chance to Mm -hmm. do. And I'm trying to figure out what it means to be in this stage where I don't yet get to take anyone with me, like structurally. Right. Um, and how do I stay accountable to my community? What do you mean by take anyone with you? Like you haven't been like, able to carry. I don't get to like hire anybody yet. Right. You know, I don't oh. get to, I don't, I don't get to be a doorstop yet. Cause the door is only just opened a crack for me. Right. 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 But even open, seeing the door open a crack and getting a chance to look into the other room. I'm sorry. I'm like, what is, does, is, does that mean something bad about me that mm-hmm. I'm able to, that I, that I somehow even gotten that? Like mm-hmm. what, what compromises have I made mm. that, I don't see. Mm. So that's, that's one source mm-hmm. for me right now. Or are you the Trojan horse? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I prefer to think of it as a doorstop. You're feeling some anxiety and fear over like making sure, since you're not there yet, that you do do that. You do open the door for yeah. others and it's not, it doesn't become just for and, you. Cause I don't know how to do it yet. Right. Like right. you have to get, you have to, the door has to be opened for you. And then learning the skill of keeping the door open is a totally different skill. Right. And I feel a lot of, I feel, I feel a lot of, of anxiety and, and, and a sense of, you know, and, and some sense of shame around like, w- have I sold out in some way that I don't even understand? Mm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Cause I, that, that it hasn't played out yet. Right. right. It's kind of just floating out there. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. What does self-acceptance mean to you? To me, self-acceptance is, I mean, it's kind of what I said earlier. Start with the assumption that you are a mess. Start with the assumption that you're kind of a trash person and build from there. Because <laughs> you're gonna feel so much more free. I really love that. 
We could interview forever, Jacob. I personally really relate to that a lot. Mm-hmm. I've, I have come to that more lately, and it has been very freeing for me. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't like me? What am I? Nothing I can do about it. Well, of it. course, you. some people don't like me. I'm a trash person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, this is me. Like, so don't like me. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I'm a mess. Like, you yeah. don't have to like Whatever. a mess. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it is very freeing. It's, it's great. Right. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Yes. This was yes. a joy. Incredible. Really a real incredible. gift and joy. And You're mm-hmm. a gift. Mm-hmm. Well, did I want to meet your parents one day? They'll, they'll we'll do a PR tour together. I'm sure. <laughs> like, mom, come with me to New York. Yeah, that's like so I want to. I want to take my mom on Ellen. Oh my God, I would love to see you and your mom it's on my Ellen. My whole dream. Oh my God, I'm trying dreams. to make it happen. I met Betty DeGeneres, and I was like, how do I not tell you that I want your your daughter to meet my mom? And I was like, wait, you met it. Ellen's mom? I met, no, I met, yeah, I met Betty Jenner at an event, and I was like, be cool, 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 be cool. And I tried, and I don't know if I did. <laughs> I think fine. you and Ellen could def be like BFF for sure. Yeah. I see it. I'm mm-hmm. going to start meditating on that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. We hope you were inspired by this episode. Until next week, that's it from me, Elisa. And me, Lily. If you agree that facades separate us and being radically honest brings us together, Help spread the movement for radical self-acceptance by sharing this episode and subscribing to our podcast. You can also watch our videos by subscribing to our YouTube channel and following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook using the handle at StyleIQ. That's the letter U instead of the word U. And check out our book, True Style is What's Underneath, The Self-Acceptance Revolution, on Amazon or at a local bookstore near you. We can't skip ahead to a happy ending or live inside a Photoshopped image or an Instagram filter. There's no finding oneself when glossing over the truth.